This morning's scripture is from Acts 27, 39 through 44. The shipwreck. In the morning, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore, if they could. So they cast off the anchors and at the same time, and they loosened the ropes that tied the steering oars, then hoist, hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach but striking a reef, they ran the ship aground. The bow stu stuck and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that they might swim away and escape, but the centurion wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out this plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest followed, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were bought, brought safe to the land. Thank you to our choir and for that wonderful reading. We appreciate it. Again, welcome everyone. I was thinking of the many times I've seen in a professional or personal capacity the helpers at work and thought about even some of the helpers uh, that in my own life who uh, I wanted to share about as well. This is a, a, a sillier example, but we're talking about a shipwreck later, so I think this is safe to begin here. When I was about seven, I climbed the highest tree I could find near my house. My mom was inside talking to my aunt, and when they got talking, they got talking, and she was used to me just running around, finding things to do outside. But on one particular day, I got too many bursts of courage at once, and I climbed higher and higher and higher and higher. I was feeling pretty proud of myself until I looked down. And then I realized I had no idea how to get back down. So I froze. I called for help. No luck. My dad would be home in another hour or so, I guessed. So I just waited. I was perched in that tree, and my legs were getting tired, and pieces of the tree began to crack and fall, just little branches. It's more dramatic in my seven-year-old mind. But I began to wonder if I was just going to have to live here in the tree. <laughs> so I started to feel bursts of fear instead of bursts of courage. But then my dad's car pulled into the driveway, and I was rescued. My dad heard my cries. He came over half grinning, half concerned. And he coached me down, helped me to know where to place each foot. And eventually he said, Okay, now, jump. I'll catch you. Are you sure? I asked. I'm sure, he said. And then I jumped. I fell. He caught me. And then he lifted me up laughing. Thanks for rescuing me, I said. And that's what dads are for, he told me. Thankfully, that's the closest I've come to being physically stuck or stranded or lost. But I'll always remember that feeling of waiting, waiting for someone who could help me. Now, my oldest son, who was here today and loves firefighters, said, you know, you could have just called a firefighter. They could have helped you. They have a ladder. Allegedly, they help cats all the time in cartoons. But he thought I could have benefited from that. But love guided me, and love caught me when I fell. Love lifted me up again, and love saved me. I bet some of you have felt stuck or stranded or lost or in need of rescuing physically, spiritually, or otherwise. And in our scripture reading for today, Paul was experiencing such a struggle. Now we'll get to more of that in a minute, but I wanted to share some wisdom I was reviewing recently from a former seminary professor who wrote a new book about innovation. And she talks about what it means to be the church in a tumultuous world 
a world full of literal and cultural storms which have left many in our communities feeling lost at sea or totally shipwrecked. Now, if we think about the church, universal as a ship, which has promoted open skies, abundant life, and a hope for a better future, we can acknowledge that it is a vessel that at times throughout history has lost its way. The stewards of the ship have allowed it to take on water, causing many to jump overboard. At times, the church universal has been focused on its might and structure, or even the glory days of what the ship used to be, crediting that steering wheel that made them feel powerful, but neglecting the winds that the Spirit directs. But for any of the church's failures... I believe what people seek in churches and what churches still offer are actually not that far apart. Reverend Dean posited in her book that what people seek in churches and what churches seek to offer boils down to flat-out love and trying to be Jesus for the person next to you. Despite the church's history or failures in the contemporary church, either due to circumstance or ignoring the wisdom that was meant to guide our travels, I still think that the Spirit is calling us back to sea. Historically, what called us to board the boat in the first place, after all, is the love of God that animates us forward. It's this impulse to love that drives the church, drives us to love God back and to love our neighbors. And that was certainly true of the church that Paul was seeking to build and to establish in our scripture reading this morning. That early church was known for taking care of people in ways that made the powerful mad. But that impulse to love nonetheless long fueled the church as a vehicle of innovation and an unyielding source of hope in a better future, a future that always belongs to God. Now, we'll talk about that future, but let's rewind a bit to the past, to those early church experiences that Paul was, was having. Now, we're reading from the book of Acts, and some of you were in Tom's Bible study about the book of Acts, so you can, you can help correct me here and add to the conversation. But it was the early church that was empowered by the Holy Spirit to heal, to meet the needs of those in their community, and to share the good news of the gospel with all. Peter and the other apostles spread the good news of Jesus, performed miracles, and unfortunately ended up, for some of them, facing martyrdom and other persecution. The church, nonetheless, despite that persecution, expanded beyond Jerusalem. And key to all of this was Paul, a religious leader who once persecuted Christians but had been transformed by the love of Christ and became a convert and fervent evangelist. He faced many challenges. He knew what it was like to be stuck in a tree. He knew what it was like to be shipwrecked. That's what we heard at the end of this passage today. He was persecuted by religious authorities, by the Roman leaders, and Paul, when we found him today, was on a boat, a prisoner being transported to Rome. He had been arrested in Jerusalem and underwent several trials He appealed to Caesar, which led to his transport to Rome in the first place. So the arrangements had been set for sailing to Italy, and Paul and a few other prisoners were placed under the supervision of a centurion named Julius, a member of the elite guard. They boarded the ship, and off they were bound for Ephesus and Ports West, and after a brief stop, They were out to sea again, sailing north to yet another port. Then Julius found an Egyptian ship headed to Italy, had the prisoners loaded onto that ship as well, but they ran into bad weather. They found it impossible to stay the course, and after much difficulty, they made it to another harbor, appropriately named Good Harbor. By now, they had lost a lot of time, though, They had passed the autumn equinox, so it would be stormy weather from here on out. Dangerous for sailing. And so Paul warned everybody, I only see disaster for our cargo, for our ship, not to mention 
our lives if we put out to sea now. But the harbor they were at, despite its wonderful name, was not the best for staying the winter. So other folks convinced them to move on forward to Phoenix. And Julius the Centurion sent, set Paul's warning aside, and off they were to the next harbor. But in this story, things just keep getting worse. A gentle southerly breeze came up, giving them the illusion that it was fine to go sailing. Smooth sailing, though, was not what they found. And instead, no sooner were they out to sea than a gale-forced wind took over. The infamous nor'easter struck, and they lost all control of the ship. It was just a cork in the sea. And perhaps you know what that feels like to be lost at sea, to be overwhelmed by the challenges that you're facing. Now for them, they ended up on a small island somehow. They managed to get a lifeboat ready and and reef the sails. But things, again, kept getting worse. They only managed to avoid some of the challenges next by setting on the high seas, noticing the badly damaged ship that they had, and it was starting to be too heavy. So they were going to have to let go of some things on that ship. They were out on the high seas again. They dumped their cargo overboard. And the next day, the ship had to be lightened further by throwing off all of their tackle and provisions. And it had been many days since anybody had seen the stars or the sun. Wind and waves were battering them unmercifully and having lost their drift anchors, their cargo, their tackle, their provisions, while most of them started to lose hope. How much can anybody sustain without losing hope? I've known so many who have lost and lost and lost, and despite their faithfulness, despite all that they were seeking to do to make their situation better, just continue to be hurt and to lose more and more and more, wondering how much longer it can go on like this, and then it gets worse. But in the midst of all that, Paul stands up and says, well, friends, you really should have listened to me back in Crete. We could have avoided all of this trial, which, you know, thanks for that, Paul. Like, I told you so. But he doesn't stay there long. Instead, he says, but none of that matters now. From now on, Paul delivers this message of hope. Things are looking up. Can you imagine? In the midst of all this, they're losing all that was on the ship. Paul says, but there's still something left for us. Paul does give the caveat that the ship itself will be doomed, but each of us is going to make it. God told me, said Paul, not to give up. You're going to stand before Caesar yet, and everyone sailing with you, everyone is going to make it. So dear friends, take heart. I believe God will do exactly what he told me, said Paul. But we are going to shipwreck on some island or another. Paul embodies what leadership scholars call critical hope. It's a kind of hope that's very compelling to me because it's not a dishonest hope. It's not an irrational, idealistic hope. It's a way of saying, yes, things are bad. Things are very bad. And yet, there is a way forward still. On the 14th night, adrift somewhere on the sea at about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. Maybe this was the hope that they were waiting for. So they threw out for anchors. They prayed for daylight, prayed for some relief from the suffering they were experiencing. And when some of the sailors tried to jump ship, Paul wouldn't let them. They said, no, we're all going to be able to do this together. They decided to eat some food. They broke bread. Amid that, they broke bread, gave thanks, passed it around, and then threw the rest of the grain overboard. But in the morning, as we read earlier, they didn't recognize the land that they saw. They decided to run the ship on the beach anyway. They cut the anchors, they loosened loosened the tiller, they raised the sail, and they ran before the wind toward the beach. At last, things were going to get better. But they didn't make the beach. They couldn't catch a break. Still far from the shore, the ship itself began to break into smithereens. 
Some of the soldiers, as we read, wanted to kill the prisoners, but Paul and Julius intervened. They wanted to see them safe. And they just encouraged them, those who can make it, just swim, and the rest of you just grab a piece of the broken ship and hope for the best. So there they were, holding the pieces of their broken ship, being battered by the storms. They couldn't lose anything else, they thought, but then the ship itself went to pieces. We're told, though, in the scriptures that somehow, despite all of that, and I know you're getting the point here, that they made it to safely, safety. They found themselves in Malta, and then they were shown kindness from the island's inhabitants, and Paul helped to heal the sick. Eventually, they did make it to Rome, and despite all this imprisonment, all this suffering, all this sure and certain death around them, Paul remained hopeful, animated by the love of God and the hope that he had in God. The animating force of his hope was the love of Christ, and this ought to remain the animating hope for the church today. Now, there have been times, I know, in your life where perhaps you may have lost everything, maybe even your hope, maybe even the ship you were sailing on, But this story reminds us that God can use the life that is breaking apart, the ship that is breaking apart, the heart that is breaking into pieces to take us where we need to go next. God can use all of the broken pieces to save us. Now this story reminds anybody who has ever not recognized their life anymore Woken up and things were different. There was before and there was after this and things would never be the same again. That in that brokenness, you will find safety and hope and learn to live again. The people of Malta received these prisoners with with hospitality and warmth. They didn't recognize them and it's possible that your life may may have dropped you off in Malta before. It's possible that the church is in a moment where we find ourselves in a new context that we haven't been before, where things are changing, where things are unknown, where our future is uncertain. Today, as we think about the church, 28% of Americans and 43% of young people claim no faith identity whatsoever. And even amongst those who do have a faith as their central part of their identity, Most young people, the majority of young people say, a church doesn't really need to be part of that. I believe we're in a moment for the church where we're in pivotal transition time, where we might have landed in Malta, and we're going to have to receive the kindness of the unknown people around us and to extend that kindness in return, to find a new way to be church, a new way to live, but still animated by those same forces of love. Wherever Paul went, his life remained about God's love, love that calls us to the stranger, calls us to our neighbor, the people we find ourselves next to, whether we chose to be next to them or not. They are nonetheless made in God's image. Now, the first responders with us today know what it's like to serve those in their community, not evaluating who they are helping each time they help them, but helping them because it is their job, it is their duty It animates them to do so, and we have much to learn from them, too. All of us, at different points of our lives, may find ourselves sinking, and in a moment we'll sing how we are found sinking far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained with sinking to rise no more. But thanks be to God, the master of the sea, who hears our despairing cry, From the waters lifted us so we can say now, safe am I. Friends, let us sing together, love lifted me. Love lifted me when I was shipwrecked and nothing else could help. Love lifted me.